This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with Director of Sport at Canterbury Academy, Phil Ralph. Formerly working in professional cricket, he was the Academy Director and First Team Assistant at Kent. He also worked for the National Governing Body in Cricket, the ECB, and has had development experiences in New Zealand and the Boston Red Sox. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Perfect. So, Phil, I know we caught up a little bit there. Um, sounds like we've both had relatively productive days, which is good. But how are things your end? All okay? Yeah, very good. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, it's been been pretty busy. Uh, the school that I work at, it's always high pace. There's always quite a lot going on. We're at, we're a large comprehensive school down in Canterbury, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a busy time of year, but um, it's an exciting time of year as well. So, um, I've enjoyed my day. Perfect. So I think this will be a really interesting conversation because I think from experience wise for you, you've probably got quite a broad experience base to pull from and maybe discuss, which would be really good. For people that don't know you, don't know your background, do you want to kind of give, I guess, an overview of where you are now and then kind of a whistle stop tour, if you like, of of how you've ended up there? Yeah, absolutely. I'll do my best and sort of I think you hit the nail on the head by talking about that broad experience. I've I've certainly worked in a, a real range of environments from having sort of qualified as a PE teacher down at the University of Exeter, um, St Luke's College, quite some time ago now, 1993, I graduated from there. Um, so initially working in um, the state system as, as a PE teacher in, in a comprehensive school, sort of South London. I, I won't do my full career history, but somehow... I've ended up back in that system as a director of sport, but um, but along the way, had some experience in professional sport, in um, professional cricket with Kent County Cricket Club. Um, had some experiences working for a national governing body um, because I worked for the England and Wales Cricket Board in a, in a coach development role as well. Very fortunate during that role to have a couple of um, sort of scholarship experiences where I went across to the States to have a little look at the, the Boston Red Sox and how they trained, which is something um was very memorable for me. But I also spent six months in New Zealand um, working at their high performance cricket centre just outside Christchurch. Um, and certainly those two experiences were, were very important in, in terms of shaping myself. But um, yeah, and, and, and several schools as well, um, from comprehensives to grammar schools, ne- never worked in the private system, but I've had a lot of experience working in the private system and um, yeah met a, a range of people worked in a range of environments um, and have loved every minute of it really. Perfect yeah I think it gives a really nice base for which people to to, to listen to this and we'll, we'll try and dive into as much of this as we can over the next hour or so. Um, so I guess obviously you, you linked there quite a lot on the cricket side. Um, yeah. I know obviously a director of sport now, but you mentioned quite a lot there around the cricket base. Is that where your heart lays mainly with sport? Is that what you grew up playing? Is that where your passion lies? Yeah, kind of why cricket, I guess. It's, it's a really good question. I, and I think it's probably twofold sports wise. I, mean, I, I love my football, absolutely love my football. And I, I think potentially, you know, Hindsight's a great thing. If I if I look back on my time at Exeter University, I might have just chosen a slightly different route after sort of graduating down there. I was very keen on doing a master's in in sports psychology, actually, in Exeter. So sort of we'll start in their first one. But the advice was having been a student for four years, go out, get in the wide world and maybe come back. Well, I I did come back. Speaking of a master's, I've just done staffs unis. Um, online sport and exercise psychology um and I sort of yeah a little bit late it was about I think 35 years later finally got that one under my belt and and really enjoyed that but but cricket I suppose you know my my, my family was was very sort of into sport my, my my father would have played a lot of football but also loved his cricket as well and played some cricket and yeah I um I was lucky enough to go to a grammar school where there was regular sport. So we would play sort of Saturday mornings, got involved in the club system as well. Um, I played a sort of reasonable level of non-league football um, and again sort of was was playing reasonable level of league cricket. Uh, was never good enough to, to go on and get any better with that. But coaching it became something that I became very passionate about, actually, whether that was because of my own failings as a player. Um, and I think if I look back, 
having a lack of belief and, and possibly suffering a little bit from sort of competitive sport anxiety at times. I think that was something that maybe held me back quite considerably, um, plus quite a bit of talent and lack of ability. But um, the the move into coaching was almost born of, I suppose, having a very inspirational PE teacher. Um, and it is amazing, I think, how often your, your PE teacher can really shape you as a young sports performer and getting a chance to go down to Exeter. Um, I learned a lot of things down there. Learned a lot through actually working with some fantastic PE teachers on teaching practices. And um, almost the natural step from teaching was to sort of go into coaching. So um, that was how those sort of things um, evolved, really. Yeah, so if we... If we uh, I don't think we discuss necessarily... Um how much that blend and those experiences can you know inform practitioners from a coaching perspective of you know working in schools and for me that the, the story I always go back to is it's working with the children that maybe don't want to be there and being able to inspire them and that that allows you to really grasp you know when you're in a uh, performance perspective of people that do want to be there it makes your life way easier but having that skill sets uh, skill sets imperative in my opinion so when when we're talking about those formative years as you as a teacher, what mm. skills do you think were able to help you cross over when you did eventually make that transition into a more coach specific environment? Uh, firstly, you you make a great point about those sort of skills of inspiring and creating a love for the sport becoming so important. You know, people phrase that don't know the, the time spent in the trenches. Is I, I don't think that's a great analogy in a way the trenches were obviously a lot harder than what we do when we're working in youth sport but I think that time as an 18 year old working on holiday camps um, and then those early years as a PE teacher I think what you you learn the importance of preparation um, I've always been a planner um, and and that's something that sort of is still with me now. I probably spend less time in terms of the detail because I think that flexibility and that allowance to sort of, you know, let your sessions go off into different places is very important. Um, communication skills. I mean, I, I seriously wish, <laughs> and if I look back at how I taught initially and, you know, how I was very unaware about how to use my voice, body language it wasn't such an issue for me, um, but you know, in terms of having a, I don't know, a calm, almost sort of lower your voice rather than raise it type sort of approach would have been something I would have benefited from. Benefited from. I, I was a bit 100 mile an hour. I remember someone coming in to watch one of my lessons and say, please tell me you don't work at that pace all the time. And I sort of looked at them and like, well, this, this is my pace. This is how I work. But on reflection, that was a that was a great point. And I, I think, you know, the things that I learned early on, you, you've got to be organised. I, I always like to be one step ahead. Um, the ability to think on your feet. I think that was very important at the time and, and, and stood me in good stead as I sort of moved through. Um, and equally, that just the importance of those communication skills as well and how you use your voice. I think that plan a bit is a really interesting one because... Um... I know a few years ago on social media, I saw like someone that was taking a picture of I think Brendan Rogers session plan. And, uh, you know, I, Roberto Martinez had done a couple of talks and saying we plan it every 30 seconds. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Before, I guess, my view points in that you mentioned around the having freedom for sessions to go off in different places. So mm -hmm. what made you kind of go towards that progression of going right this before it was highly structured highly planned to now I've got an outline but I'm comfortable where this could go that came from almost working in coach development and initially delivering on a skill acquisition module and almost being forced I think when you when you go into coach ed when you're standing up in front of a lot of coaches you need to know your stuff. Um, you, you've got to have some credibility. And interestingly, my time with the ECB, when I got that initial coach development role, I, I hadn't done a massive amount of coaching in, in high performance environments. So, you know, it was a little bit of a challenge initially, but I found the skill act stuff really, and I almost prefer to call it skill development. I think it, it almost becomes overly academic when we call it skill acquisition. But I, I found that fascinating. And, and, and I think that... You know, I look at a lot of Russell. I used to look at a lot of Russell Earnshaw stuff. Danny Newcomb has been sort of quite important for me in terms of shaping some of my ideas. And I, I think that 
problem solving, creating players that have flair, are able to sort of express themselves. That became more important to me than necessarily having every 10 minutes structured so that, you know, I knew what was going on. And you, a lot of coaches have a, a controlling element to them. And I think I think naturally that would be one of my flaws at times. So I've had to work really hard on actually, you know, abdicating that responsibility and, and giving that to the players. Ultimately, cricket is a game where the coach can influence quite a bit. But in terms of sort of, you know... <laughs> watch a bit of basketball I score very good at basketball I think the, the coaches on the edge of a court sometimes have quite an influence on a game closer proximity um and it's 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 almost more of a cultural thing but that impact is there and I'm not saying every coach coaches like that in basketball but there seems to be that that sort of ability to get information to players cricket's a little bit different um <laughs> you you can share information but but very often, right out in the middle there, it's, it's the player who's got to take a lot of responsibility, particularly tactically, particularly sort of strategically. And so, you know, you, the more you can be doing that in training, the more use they are to actually doing that in games, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does 100 percent. And I think that it's, um, yeah, it's a really interesting thing, as, as you mentioned there, around that planning structure to freedom. Uh, I agree with you. I started off being very like this is what my session is going to be to now go right this is the topic these are some of the sessions I want to have in there but we'll see how we go if we don't do that bit because we're getting real value that's fine um you know I did a session last night where I planned for one part of the session to be 20 minutes end up being 40 and that's fine because actually we were getting progression of them understanding the practice then they were getting good outcomes. Then they were doing a bit of exploration in there. I thought actually this is worthwhile. So it's um it's a really interesting balance. Um, looking then, I guess, when you went into that first role at Kent, can you just explain, I guess, what your role was um, and then what you tried to do in that environment? So what were you trying to create? What, I guess, from a personal point of view, what did, what outcomes were you after? Um, I guess, how did you achieve some of those as well? Yeah, so I went in uh, as academy director at Kent. So my role was working with, I suppose, uh, the players that were, in that 16 to 19 age bracket and were had been identified as players that had the potential to play professional cricket. So it was a combination of sort of an ed educational side of things, just in terms of, you know, your your classic performance factors, tech, tech um, mental, physical and, and the lifestyle side of things. So I would be liaising with performance lifestyle advisors, you know, a whole sort of um, support team, including your psychologist, your S&C and your physio, but also a, a group of assistant coaches as well. And then it was a dual role at Kent. So I also sort of coached for second team as well. So I think that was quite a familiar or a, a common thing in a lot of counties, um, sometimes born out of financial, but also born out of the fact that actually the academy director, you need to see your players in a competitive environment regularly. So it sort of dovetailed quite nicely. So my job was really preparing them to play at the next level. Um, and it was it was trying to manage the pressures that would be associated with sort of going to the next level. It was making them aware of some of the demands of the next level. Um and I've used that word quite a lot of that fries for next level because I think that's that's essential. And and again, you know, almost similar to I suppose to how I stepped into the ECB, working in coach ed and up front delivering a lot of um coaching courses, having not done a lot of the high performance coaching. I mean, there was there was part of that at Kent as well, to to an extent, in that I'd never played pro pro cricket, I'd never coached in professional cricket, but now as an academy director, I had to learn quite quickly you know, what was involved at that highest level. And you can be on the other side of the fence and get a feel for it. But I think until you're actually in the mix, it is quite difficult to understand some of the demands on players. So I was really lucky. Um, I worked with some, some fantastic people and particularly the players as well. The players were really, really good to me I, and I learned so much from them. Uh, but it really helped sort of, again, sort of my work with those younger players. And... Uh, for people that maybe don't aren't familiar with the academy system within mm. cricket, could you give, I guess, one, an overview of that, of what that looks like as a summary? And then two, you mentioned that perception from what you thought or felt from the outside to, yeah. I guess, rally, reality when you've then gone in it. Can you just describe to us, I guess, what that perception to reality actually felt and, yeah, felt yeah. like when you got in? 
Yeah, I, I, I think the first thing, the like the academy system in cricket, I, mean, I look at it almost from a school teacher's point of view now, but my understanding of a lot of football programmes is that actually the clubs are able to have the players within sort of a school environment that they have quite a lot of involvement with. In, in, a, in a county cricket academy, a lot of the players will be at, well, they'll all be at different schools for a start. Um, generally, because of the profile of the game, it tends to be sort of independent schools. And there are some more from the state sector. We might even go on to that a little bit later on, possibly. But I think what you have is you're basically managing however you've got on your academy. We used to have sort of between eight and ten. You're, you're managing those players across the whole year. So you are you're responsible for planning their programs. You're responsible for working with them and their parents. That sort of triangle is really, really important, that communication. Um, but equally, you're also sort of trying to make sure that they are challenged appropriately in the summer. And sometimes that's a challenge with the demands of some of the cricket that they're playing because their schools want to have them because rightly so, them on scholarships and everything. So therefore, the school expects them to play on a Saturday afternoon, whereas we sometimes feel that actually the club cricket and the Premier League game when it in a challenging environment will be better for those players. So it, there was there was a lot of sort of management and, and plotting ahead with it. Um, so, you know, typical, similar. The, the year would be periodised. So you'd have your rest and recovery September and October. Then you'd, you'd do a lot of sort of technical preparation. But it's a long off season. Cricket really is a long off season. You know, I, I find that working in a school environment, you know, we have... We have the players back together in September and October and you, you've you got to be so careful that you don't get into things too quickly. And so there is a lot of different stuff, game of volleyball, you know, things that actually just away from cricket. Um, the other issue we have, which again, I don't think football is challenged with, is the... Is the winter program is indoors. You know, ideally we'd all be flying off to Australia or the subcontinent to train, but, but that is not the reality. So therefore coaches have become increasingly better at managing indoor programs on on surfaces that the players are never going to play on when it comes to the real game that's more skill development stuff i can't come away from that perception yeah you you know what i, I think one of the big thing was was the grind was the routine and demands on the players physically and mentally um i think the other thing to an extent so there was there were tactical nuances that I wasn't aware of in terms of the level of cricket I'd coached and played in that were fascinating and you can add real value to young players with those sort of things. So that was something I learned very, very quickly. I'm really fortunate to work. Rob Key was a, a captain at Kent then and um, was such a great thinker on the game that that was something that was really, really beneficial for me. But as I said, it, it is the demands, the... Um, the schedule's pretty brutal. It's pretty relentless. Um, and what you have is, you know, the players having to go from four-day cricket to, to white ball cricket, which is a sort of one-day version T20, sometimes almost overnight. Um, add a lot of travelling on that, then, you know, it does become pretty draining and everything. So I think the... Um, the skills I learned to an extent, you, you've got to be really good at reading rooms. You've got to really read people. You've got to read a change room. You've got to, you've got to get that balance right between challenge and support. I think if you get that wrong, you can almost sort of, I don't know, push players over the edge a little bit, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. And we, we will go down the skill acquisition bit and that tactical bit, because I think that is interesting to hear a little bit more on that. I guess the, the next question for me around that is, how do you prepare the younger players for one that workload, but yeah. two that mentality shift? So obviously a high profile example at the minute he's got Joffre Archer who's been yeah. out what seems like forever, yeah. numerous yeah. injuries and whatnot. Yeah. You've probably got the other end of the spectrum where you've got Jimmy Anderson yeah. at 42 or 41 or 40, whatever yeah. he is. I'm thinking this guy could go on to, you know, 60 years old the way he's going. Mm. Um, but yeah, I guess the question for me is. What, how do you prepare the players for that shift of formats and for the mentality of that grind, bearing in mind they still are only 17, 18 young people who are going to make mistakes, who probably got a girlfriend or boyfriend that they're texting, who you yeah. know have all the young person insecurities and whatnot. Mm. How do you manage that type of preparation for them? That That's a great question. And I think... 
having sort of done the masters recently in sport and exercise psychology we we were lucky we got a chat i got onto some forum where manchester united's um academy director i want to say cox nick cox yeah yeah. Bang on. yeah he he spoke and it was so it was really interesting so me with my sort of it must be incredible in a professional environment. It must be hours, 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 structure, 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 um, hard yards, hard yards. I, I was expecting that sort of chat. He was massive on the holistic side of things. He was massive on players having an identity away from football, um, ensuring that they had other interests, ensuring that they were given enough time away from the game itself. Um, I, I thought he, he was really enlightening. I really enjoyed his chat. And I think there's something in that, in that I'm not sure back in when I was working at Kent 2009, I was really aware of that. Um, you know, I, I got that people needed rest and recovery and everything, but I think I was a little bit about, it's about the cricket. You've got to live this performance lifestyle that's going to turn you into this elite sports person overnight. Um, so maybe guilty of not necessarily pushing too hard, but not encouraging interest elsewhere. Um, your point about how do you prepare them for that grind? Great question. And it's something I'm sort of almost considering at the moment. You know, I'm, in the school environment I work in, it's certainly not an environment where you're working with pros or anything, but there are you know, three or four players. We've got two girls out in the Women's World Cup at the moment, the under-19s, and we've got several on the fringes of Kent systems and one led in the academy. You, you're you looking at, I mean, I suppose my, my, my challenge at the moment is how you develop that resilience in young players. Um, very often, I think we're very quick to dismiss players as being soft and fragile and writing players off at 15, 16 without actually doing anything to help them. What does that help involve? I think that help involves a little bit of awareness raising. It, it possibly, for want of a better phrase, it almost involves sharing some best practice, sharing some stories of, you know, this is the type of, um, this is the type of work you should be doing um, based on what we know from the sort of data and everything with, you know, fast bowlers in particular. Um, I think another thing is getting quite scientific about managing workloads and making sure that players are fresh. Um, but I think the other thing is is having opportunities to spend quality time with players. And you learn so much when you're away overseas or where you're away on tours with players. I mean, those are the sometimes the moments where you you find out who struggles to sleep. You find out the nutrition side of things. You know, can everyone every every young player can produce a food diary for you. And unfortunately, in this day and age, I think, I think. You know, a little bit, I, 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 I find this as a teacher. Sometimes kids are very good at telling you what you want to hear and people can create these food, food diaries for you and you think, well, that's interesting. And then you go away on tour, or you go away on a camp and you see you see that, you know, you've got a couple of players who don't eat breakfast, who struggle to, uh, to sort of engage with that sort of meal at the start of the day, which then has a massive impact. So, look, there's, there's a lot of education. There's a bit of raising awareness. There are there's sharing best, best practice. And then I suppose there's there's creating a culture, and I think you know we might we might get onto values and culture because the more I'm in sport, the more important that stuff is. Probably more important than technical, tactical, mental, and physical. It is the culture stuff. I think if you've got a culture where you've got decent ambassadors in your in your pro squad, and you've also got decent people within the actual setup itself, the academy setup, they start everyone starts living and breathing those sort of types of behaviours. So, yeah, I, again, I could be completely wrong with the individual, but how do you manage that with someone who absolutely that's all they want to do? And they they maybe go into the school mm. or they go mm. into the college because mm. they want to be in the performance program, because they mm. want to have that progression route and yeah. education or whatever else around it is kind of secondary. It's like, well, no, this mm. is my best opportunity to make it into the pro ranks. I only want to bat. I want to do extra. What does that look like to support those players? Because they're obviously driven. You don't want to take that away from them, but you're trying mm. to balance it as well. That is a great question. And it is actually really, really common in cricket and potentially becoming increasingly so with the advent of a lot of private coaches now who who seem to get really busy in counties around September and October because all of a sudden players are thinking, right, county trials coming up, November, December, I need to get in the nets. And 
and September and October, as I've already sort of alluded to earlier on, that for me is a time to be playing some football, playing some rugby, playing some hockey, you know, something that actually takes you away from cricket. What do you do about that obsessive, that perfectionist? It's a great question. Um, and it's something actually, my my master's assignment, my dissertation was on the condition for yips in cricket, where, you know, similar to dartitis, where, where a darts player can't let go of the dart. You know, some cricket players have unfortunately suffered from this syndrome where they actually can't let go of the ball. And having interviewed quite a lot of coaches that have worked with players experiencing this, one of the common things that came out was this perfectionist personality and this obsessive nature. Um, look, that's probably not the greatest advice when you're working with one of these players to suddenly to turn around. If you keep doing this, you're going to get the yips. I mean, for a start, it's not something that's associated with batting, so it's probably only you the bowlers. But I think you've just got to you've got to work with the parents. I think you've got to work with a player, um, and you, I think you've just got to examine sort of wh whether you can even sort of start working with your sports psych. If your sports psych's on the program as well, then I think that helps because I think sometimes it's just a very unhealthy thing to get into. We were lucky again, I sort of referencing staffs, they're doing well out of this, but staff's got a guy called Jamie Barker in, a psychologist who, who works, um, I think he's based out of Loughborough. Worked a lot in pro pro sport and, and with Olympic athletes as well. And he talked about something called um, rational emotive behaviour therapy. There you go. There's a jargon for the session. And, and, and that was almost looking at the way that sometimes young players have such a drive that it's actually unhealthy. So I must score... 800 runs in the first two months of the season. I must make sure that I get into the county side. You know, he he talked a lot about unhealthy language and some of the things you can notice as a coach. And then again, his his advice was actually sort of working on, on some awareness raising. Um, he had something called a badness scale. And they talked about getting players to almost rate on a scale, I think if I've re remembered it correctly, one to a hundred some really bad things so initially a player would come and say right okay yeah it'd be terrible if I um if I didn't get any runs in the first three games of the season was averaging four by by the end of month one and he said right okay on a scale of one to 100 where would that be and you know the player oh, 85 86 and then he talked to them about right well if you lost your phone out of one to 100 what it'd be and then he <laughs> started going into some pretty deep, dark places. He talked about, right, OK, if a member of your family suddenly gets ill and everything. And I think what he was trying to do was actually using a scale like that to get some perspective and some rationality in. But um, it's hard. You, you've you asked a great question there. I mean, you must experience that in football as well. We do. And the one-to-one -one coaches are becoming increasingly common. If you Google it or YouTube yeah. it or Instagram it or TikTok it or whatever other social <laughs> form you want to use, we see that more and more where people are doing extra. I think probably the added challenge we have is the, the age of which our academy system starts. You know, yes. we see in, in England, we, it starts at nine years old, under nines. So you're looking at year four at school is when they can officially become, mm. and I'll put this in inverted commas, registered players. Yeah. Um, with pre-academy, they've got a couple of years in around that as well. But you do see, obviously, these players that, um, that obviously are obsessed by it. The challenge is, if I'm really honest, those that practice and are going out and doing those extras are often, at the, this moment in time, your high performers. Yeah, so there's yeah. an element of if you practice, you do see the rewards of it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's kind of where do you find that balance? Yeah. Of yeah. And you know, I I say this to him. Like, I'm I'm big on practice culture. I think it's really yeah. really important. But I always frame it as if you practice, whatever you practice, you'll get better at. So it doesn't yeah. matter if it's football maths yeah. geography english yeah. language you practice it you get better to try yeah. and turn it to a life skill rather than just yeah. a football related skill yeah. but it's a really i find it's a really fine balance because we want them to practice we want it to be self-directive practice we want them yeah. to want to go and do it so do you put the brakes on yeah if they're doing it or do you go okay it's great that you're doing it is this sustainable for you do you think yeah and kind of go down the route of 
working together to come up with a sustainable program rather than yes. one where you're telling them they can't do it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's a yeah good I point. think that's the challenge. Because I mean, there's a couple of things that came from that. I mean, firstly, I suppose my first question is, um, it, it the type of practice is important as well, isn't it? Because I'm a massive fan of the unstructured stuff where it is quite game based and it's not dependent on a coach being there and everything. And it's certainly for cricket. I feel think of a batter. There's a lot of closed and predictable stuff you can do, and. and we are sometimes guilty in cricket of churning out lots of players that have obviously spent a lot of time on a bowling machine. And they're, they're, there's almost a, a technique that makes you a good bowling machine proficient player. And then actually, when it comes to the real game, sometimes these players are limited in terms of how they judge the length of the ball. Their their perception isn't great. They're not good at identifying cues. Um, and therefore, their decision making isn't so great. So it's I suppose it's a type of stuff and you you know through, through my experiences I hear a lot about the amount of cricket that they play as young kids on the subcontinent you know they were sometimes playing two games every every day and just the whole range of experience they get from doing that and what they're building up with that um, but you know football I suppose is one of the greatest unstructured games in the country, isn't it? Jumpers for goalposts, you you see it a lot, and um, that type of stuff can only be a good thing, I suppose. Yeah, in an ideal world, you'd have them playing games. Yeah. You know, yeah. in an ideal world, when we say practice, it would be go and do 15 minutes practice on this, on your IDP, mm. whatever it is, and then try and do that in a game with your mates down the park. Yeah. I think probably the bit that we... And I, which is maybe I, because it's my my perception of it. Probably the bit that I try and focus on if I'm encouraging practice is rather than sitting around doing nothing. Um, so it's like being engaged in your learning. So yeah. I kind of work on the premise, and I've been fortunate enough to have you know a lot of skill acquisition people on, on the podcast. Yeah. I work on the premise of doing something's better than nothing. So yeah. whilst in an ideal world, we wouldn't want someone just going against the bowling machine or going against yeah. the wall right. or going against yeah. that. It's like, actually, if you've got someone who's throwing the ball against the wall yeah. and is prov- uh, practicing a reverse sweep or practicing a ramp shot or practicing this, and they're doing that, you know, with a little bit of variability in terms of yeah. it comes off the wall in a different way, yeah. is that better? than them sat doing not a lot and I I think the answer then is yes so I think it's not optimal practice but But, it's better than nothing and I think that you you then can kind of sculpture it to go okay well you can do this practice skill now let's try and add it on and then once you know that they've got that base which they've had a go at home it's like well now can we put that into our open sessions yeah so I've yeah. seen you. I've seen your video of you practicing this ramp shot. Let's see it. If it yeah. goes wrong, it's fine. But you yeah. can do it because I've seen it. Yeah. So it's really managing that dynamic between the with, between the two areas, I guess. No, that's interesting. And, and, and then my other question was almost around fight again, for want of a better word, but real sort of deep seated um, refusal to give up, refusal to be intimidated on pitch. I mean, and, and the only reason I say this is just something that was in my head, funny enough, from dropping down and helping out with a year eight football team before Christmas. And look, we, yeah, typical game of school football and everything, but a game we, we lost. And I just reflected on the way back with the, the teacher I was working with. And it was just thinking of the 12, 14 players we had on the bus. They were all, as 13 year olds, single sport kids. They just played football. They didn't play anything else. And um, I don't know, just sort of thinking whether that's healthy or not and whether some of the stuff they were doing, they were, several of them are involved with different coaching companies and academies that sometimes, you know, promise something and, and, and fail to sort of deliver. Be careful where I go here. But, you know, you just wonder whether that sanitised coaching is... That, you know, would it be better for them to go and play some basketball? I know basketball is a non-contact sport, but actually there's quite a bit of contact. And, you know, suddenly going into an environment where you've got to fight to actually survive to an extent, playing a bit of rugby, playing a different sport, doing some gymnastics, running a 1500. I don't know. Is that is that something you see a little bit in players as they come through? The ones that are, have a range of different sport experiences, does that help their character on the pitch? Perfect. So I'd say, um, in my experience, I think the multi-sport thing, from where my experience, 
doesn't have that much effect on the character side. Yeah. I think it's healthy for them. Uh, yeah. And we actively encourage it. So, you know, there was one boy that we worked with this year. He was like, oh, I've been selected for tag rugby, but it means I'd miss training. We were like, well, then miss training. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Like you, you. He was like, "It's five weeks." I was like, "It's yeah. fine." Or if it's yeah. school tournaments, because I think it's good for them. Not although at primary school they probably still are the best at everything. If we're being honest, because yeah. if you're good at primary school at sport, you probably are best at everything, uh, sport wise. We, I think it's good for them as they get older to realize there might be somebody who's really good at tennis and then they go yeah. back to not being the best. And how does yes. that feel? So, yeah. you know, does that tennis person come up being arrogant and the way they treat you, considerations around that? Mm. Um, or the rugby player who's a brute, like, how does that feel? So they get an understanding of that. My opinion on the on the cultural stuff and uh, going um plug in another podcast here is the, the the performance one the performance podcast is around that cultural architect stuff yes so i yeah. actually think at those younger age groups if you can find a player who has a characteristic of being combative yeah uh, or aggressive or resilient or whatever terminology you want to put around mm. that it drags the rest with them yeah because yeah they want to win so much or don't want to lose so much or want to compete so much or whatever it is when you start doing 1v1s which is what we're quite heavy on yeah in order to have an opportunity to win at that 1v1 that's a entry of requirement yeah um so you ha- you have to have that to have the opportunity so then all of a yeah. sudden like the second and third best people that want to try and you know win the game or win the race or whatever it is get that then all of a sudden you've got three out of your 12 yeah so then it and it begins to rub off a little bit more so yeah, yeah my opinion is it's more of a at those younger age groups if you can find an individual who has that that real um combative nature and resilience yeah, yeah. whatever reason it might be genetics it might be life experience it might be yeah. um yeah, learn from from parents and, and yeah. school and stuff. If you can find one of those in your group, they will that will help the rest of the group develop yeah. that. Even if naturally that wouldn't be their character. Yeah, that's 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 a really good point. I, I mean, as you were talking there, I think the equivalent to an extent is like the one v one training environment in cricket will be bowler against batter. And what has been quite an interesting dynamic with this this school side I'm working with now, we we've been successful, and 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 a lot of that has been because we've probably been underdogs in in most of the higher level competitions we've been involved in. So we we've, we've taken people by surprise, but we've got a real a real sense of togetherness, a real good team spirit, and we've we fought hard in games. Now, the group have bonded really well, almost to the point where it you could say actually maybe too well. In the training now, when you want it, like you were talking about your 1v1 sort of football scenario, when you want bowlers versus batters being quite cutthroat, quite intense, we haven't quite got that because they're such good mates that sometimes they can't detach those friendships from that competitive battle. Look, we've... (laughs) And there's a coach with some really good people, and, and and two of us have almost gone in there throwing balls and using the sidearms and everything, and trying to simulate what it might be in the heat of battle, and and that doesn't involve a ridiculous amount of swearing and um, and bullying at all, but it just involves an intensity that maybe our current set of bowlers aren't doing. I I, I think you're right. I think. And that's something we don't necessarily have at the moment is that cultural arch- architect, even though when we come together as a team, I then see that fight. So it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And I think that, as you said, if you did say, for example, you had that one bowler like Jimmy Anderson, for example, might yeah. be really chirpy in the nets. Yeah. And if you're trying to like run down the wicket at him and hit him for six, he, he's like, no, like, yeah. we're, not, we're not doing that. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, because he's been a bit chirpy, you've got, you know, Joe Root at the other end go like I'm I'm going very common language here, but wind your neck <laughs> it, wind your neck in a little bit, Jimmy. Yeah. Like give it a rest. Yeah. All of a sudden there's that combative edge. Yeah. So then when you're going up against the Aussies down under and you're getting stick from sixty thousand yeah. at MCG, 
Mm. Or you've got Mitchell Johnson. I know that's not that's going to leave scars for some of our batsmen, but you've got him <laughs> bowling in. At least you've had some level of familiarity with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that that for me that's a really interesting piece. I guess you mentioned a little bit around the culture, and you obviously said mm. around working in New Zealand, mm. um, and then obviously having the opportunity to go out to the Red Sox um, yeah. in terms of yeah. baseball and stuff. From a cultural perspective, did you learn anything in terms of, I guess, one what what are the perception of England, et cetera, is, but also maybe yeah. taking some elements of what they do that you go, actually, why don't we inform our practice with that type of stuff? Yeah, great question. And yeah, the New Zealand experience was some time ago now, but they just punched above their weight, you know, with the resource that they had. But they were really, I thought they were ahead of their time just in terms of training methods. So when I went over there, I think a lot of our practices in cricket environments were quite traditional net based training and I don't know quite close quite predictable they were they were big on scrimmages it was the first time as a young coach I'd ever come across that phrase you know the idea of actually having some proper sort of bowlers versus batters um battles effectively you know they 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 talked about um a lot of key performance indicators they they used data really really well I mean, this, this is before, when I was there, it was before games were streamed. It was when data was pretty minimal. And, you know, one of the tasks I had was I was over there prior to a World Cup, actually. And I had to end up analysing quite a lot of figures off an ESPN Crick Info. There are other websites available. Um, website, which, you know, spent just long hours looking at, you know, slow left arm spinners and how how certain batters, what their average was. It, it was it was fascinating stuff. And at the time, it was probably ahead of its time. So I think that gaining a competitive advantage through thinking outside the box, that was that was something that I got from New Zealand. The Red Sox was just a ridiculous resource. I was there at a spring training camp. It wasn't with the, the top side. It was everything, but literally everything beneath. Coaches meetings of 40 plus people, but real detail, high accountability, precision in training um, and, you know, just a lot of skill work as well. Lots of skill work. Funnily enough, not a massive amount. I suppose they were pre-season, so S&C should have still been relatively important, but not a massive amount of time on S&C. Um, just a lot of skill work and everything. And then pre-season. It's interesting, actually, because now you've said it, their pre-season really reflected the demands of the actual playing season in terms of the travel and the amount of games they would play. They they ended up playing, I think, when we were there for two weeks. So, so 14 days. They played something like 12 games in those 14 days, every afternoon. And I think it was... This this is what's coming. This is... If you, if you make it to the big leagues, this is the sort of stuff you're going to have to get used to. So... Um, and it, it, it was unbelievable. You know, Florida... Two weeks um, at Easter was um, it wasn't the worst trip, definitely. Yeah, no, we've actually had a couple of weeks ago someone called Aaron Gershfield, I want to say that that's his name, uh, who works in the Yankees organization, who was talking around I think it's 162 games a season at major leagues without uh, going through playoffs, which obviously yeah. shows you that travel and whatnot. I guess it is. There's quite a similarity in terms of like the net session principle with them yeah. kind of throwing and stuff. So how did they, I guess, manage um, skill acquisition in, in that point of view? I, I imagine, you know, they've got quite a lot of different bowling styles, uh, similar yeah. to cricket, to yeah. type delivery from sliders to fastballs to yes. curveballs, all that yeah. type of stuff. So how did, uh, I guess, either the uh, pitchers or the batsmen yeah. during that period go around skill acquisition? And did you hear or see much talk around that from the coaching staff? Well, that's again, great point. And they talked about the beauty and the competitive advantage of unorthodoxy in the pitches. So they felt that cloning everyone to throw in exactly or pitch in exactly the same way, it became easier for batting. I mean, in batting in baseball is one of the hardest things you can do in the world in the world. I think, you know, the the absolute guns of brilliant players have this, you know, 30% success rate or something like that. I'm probably behind on the stats now. But I think um, at the time, there were some slightly quirky 
pitching actions coming into the game and yeah, they'd existed for a long time but more there was a Japanese pitcher who who had this very strange throwing action but the Red Sox were all over him in that look this is great this is a really hard cue for a batter this is something so different to what they normally see that he has an advantage and again video analysis wasn't ma- massive at the time there as a part the skill development was really interesting and again the resource but what we <laughs> Coaching fielding in cricket is a is an interesting one in that fielding is is such an important part of the game. And now you see the athleticism, some of the incredible sort of plays to coin an American phrase that you see in cricket are are outstanding. And they're born of incredible athleticism, but but amazing feats of skill. But very often in cricket, when we coach fielding, there's one coach throwing a ball up to themselves, hitting it out and a group of fielders working quite a traditional way of uh, approaching coaching fielding now back then the red sox would be really precise about how they would manage that particular skill development session or training session they that, that the coach they would have one coach throwing the ball up and, and hitting it out but they'd also have another coach almost stood parallel with the fielder effectively almost if you imagine where a tennis line judge would be that that close to them just literally watching their footwork, watching the position of their glove, then looking at the base they created before throwing, you know, to the point they were saying that, listen, when you're throwing the ball up to yourself and hitting, you're going to miss key things. So again, I suppose it was that attention to detail. And um, it's something that struck me a little bit. We're often a little bit under-resourced, but equally, you know, what I occasionally do, I get players to throw balls up and hit where so I can actually get in a better position to coach. The the observation, the analysis that they did was was really, really good. Um, and I don't know if you get the same thing in football. I, th- I think sometimes it is very difficult to observe and analyse well if you're running a session in that your mind is sometimes constantly thinking of, right, what are we doing next? What's going on over there? I mean, can can we seriously tune in exactly to the minutiae? Do, do you know where I'm coming from? Yeah, I always find it easier if someone else is leading a practice or session, be able to step yeah. back as far far yeah. easier because you're, you're less worried about, well, where's the next football coming from? You know, <laughs> are they following the rules rather than going, oh, this is actually doing what I want it to do. Um, yeah. So I think that's far easier. What I kind of listen to you talk there, I think the uniqueness thing is really interesting mm. because I think that you look at someone like Murali, obviously oh. a very unique action. Yeah. Now, obviously, that's not the only reason that he had success. He had a phenomenal yeah. thing, but you look at Malinga as well. Great example. And we talk about over coaching. Yeah. Would someone like that get through our system or would that try and get corrected at 13, 14? So actually that unique style is what, even if it's a little bit wild at points, is what's going to get them through as a USP. Um, so I think that's a really interesting point. But also around the the hitting thing you said there is I'd imagine part of field is also understanding game situations or cues of where right. the ball may go uh, where the yeah. ball may go in yeah. relation to the body shape so you, you look at quite a lot of the catches particularly like leg slip or silly yes. point yeah they've reacted to someone all of a sudden switching to reverse sweep and yeah. now i need to shift two points aside yeah so i guess as a practitioner it's like how can i replicate that in the practice so that there's a stimulus for them to react to yeah, brilliant. Rather, point. rather than it just being hitting, because and I know where the ball's going, can I create yeah. unique stimulus at different points so they then have to react to then field? So we're getting yeah. a, a double element of it. Yeah, that's that is a great point. And it's interesting you see that say that I, I sort of attended an ECB CPD event last week and um they had one of the fielding coaches, a guy called Paul Tweddle, who's going to be working with the England Lions, who's really creative guy, very innovative thinker. And he did a, he was working with a player. It was just a good opportunity for us as coaches just to sort of watch a, an expert at work. And he did a lot of that cue work. You know, he was actually he started with a football, funny enough. He worked with a young fielder and he was, he was throwing balls at him, but he was saying, right, okay, I am going to position my body in a way you will know this will go to your left. I want you to adjust your feet so you catch it on your left side. And it was it very simple practice, and you can obviously then progress that. But, yeah, I, I, I think we do do that in cricket. Uh, I think, you know, there are 
there's a lot of coaches who are very skilled at throwing balls up to themselves and hit, and hitting drives, then cutting. And you're absolutely right. It's it's that anticipation. It's that split second that makes a massive difference. Um, and there was Paul last week showed some great footage of Ben Stokes um, getting a run out in a in a recent probably a T20 game, not even been at the World Cup, where. Traditionally, what we felt is that fielders always have to get into a split step. We're going a bit technical now, but into that sort of athletic position. If you imagine a tennis player receiving a serve, that sort of position that a football goalkeeper might take. But because Stokes had read that the batter was only defending, if he'd have gone into that split step, he would have actually cost himself time. But he read read it so well that he was onto it. And, you know, the run outs are fractions of a second, aren't they? So... Yeah, it's, it is a it is a great point you make there. I'm just thinking as as you're talking then as well, and one that I'll probably use in football off the back of this conversation is different ball types and how mm. that may change it. So I know in tennis they do this quite a lot where they have different ball uh, firmness yeah. when they're learning early yeah. on to go from yeah. a real sponge and kind of work their way up. Yeah. And I'd imagine in football, if we did this with sizes, but also firmness, the way the ball then moves is yeah. different because of, yes. you know, how it thing. And I imagine that'd be the same in cricket. Like, if, I don't know what those plastic balls are called, but if yeah. if you went from a tennis ball to one of the plastic balls to a proper ball, yeah, what your batter would then be receiving from pace wise would be different, which would yeah. alternate when he's swinging, which would then yeah. alternate the cues that's then coming. Yeah. So I yeah. think it, it would allow like as a fielder, what am I, yeah, what am I seeing from the cue, yeah. from the timing to then react to that stimulus? So yeah, just in my point now, I'm thinking like for goalkeepers, that'd be a really good one for us. And then, yeah. you know, in, in a football perspective, we- how can we use that? Cricket coaches use lots of different things to get through the winter to an extent, just to make things. I think you, your job is to to keep players loving the game in the winter because it can become a bit of a grind if you're just netting all the time. So if you use cricket balls all the time with fielding, you, you end up creating so much of an issue on the hands that people's hands end up hurting so much they don't want to come back. So you, you've got to be careful about how you do it. These balls called incredible balls, I think that's what you were looking for. They really swing. And so actually what they do, they create a real difficulty and a real challenge in training. There's a lot of stuff going on at the moment about using weighted balls as well. I don't know what the equivalent would be in football, probably not maybe the keepers throwing balls out. But, you know, I've I've recently got some and they're very good for batters. You know, the idea of just developing a little quicker hands by they hit the weighted ball. You can't hit it very far. You can hit about a metre if that. And um if you don't get your shape and your weight transfer completely right, you end up kaplinking it and the ball goes off to the side slightly. But, you know, you do this weightable practice, then put normal balls in. And the idea is, the theory is that people should be then to hit it out of the stadium. So, yeah, watch this space on that one. But, um, yeah, it's certainly maybe a bit gimmicky, but actually at the same time, I think there is some science behind it, I'm led to believe. Yeah, so some of this most simple stuff works the best. You think the person yeah. who created that little cardboard thing around a coffee cup is a millionaire, oh, so I don't, I don't think uh, that those you mentioned are You mentioned tennis a few times, and while I remember, and it is a plug, I don't know if you've seen it, Netflix are running a little documentary of a break point. Yeah, you? I need to have a watch. I haven't watched it yet, but I will. Yeah, because um, yeah, it would be really interesting to have a look fascinating at. Fascinating because look, people make their own mind up about it and everything. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, but some of the things that they've got access to, and it just struck me the vulnerability of a lot of top level sports people. We're talking about guys and girls trying to break into the top ten, and so you know, eighteenth in the world, but possessing some real vulnerability in terms of their their self-belief and everything really insightful I'm not sure about Kyrgios I think he had a, <laughs> I don't think he possessed too much vulnerability but um yeah that's a beautiful sport isn't it so many different characters yeah I'm gonna give a self-plug here for anyone that's interested in that there's a former podcast on here with Sarah Borwell who's the former GB number one um, a doubles player and yeah. she was talking around the process of them traveling uh, yeah. to and from tournaments and how they could arrive at event be ranked 16th at pair and if a higher ranking pair came in from elsewhere they then have to leave and go somewhere else so you talk about that vulnerability like that's something that 
is bred into how the the tours work. So yeah, yeah if someone is interested about that, she can give a really good first half of example yeah. of what that looks like. Um, look looking uh, or oh, linking back to one thing you said earlier, which I thought was really interesting. You mentioned around the forty members of staff sat in a room. Yeah. yeah. How did that work? Because you, you you know you often sit in team meetings or <laughs> teacher meetings or whatever and there's oh, 40 members of staff and it's either someone yeah. at the front board and everyone or yeah. it's a minefield and you've got everyone's voices opinion and it gets too much was yeah. it a good experience or was it one where it's still pretty challenging it was a different experience and it's good that you mention it i think you know we you get little insights from the media about i'm going to link this back to cricket about that current culture in the england dressing room in the test side what mccullum and stokes have done and i think one of the things i'm led to believe is that there aren't many meetings but you know <laughs> there's a real sort of um almost an emphasis on actually not meeting for the sake of meeting these red Sox ones were done at the start of the day they were done at 7 a.m and they were they were plans they were reports on players they were scouting and it was almost with 40 people in there it was actually very very well structured so five or six people would speak the head the head honcho would be um controlling it people were on a time i mean fortunately they didn't last any longer than half an hour so it was it was almost like this is where we're going today these are some of the key priorities so they were they will run pretty well but i yeah i know where you're coming from um sometimes overrated aren't they yeah i think that's a really interesting point you made there around meet not meeting for meeting's sake because sometimes mm -hmm. you can feel like it's necessary to have a meeting but it's actually like right more than check in this is a plan for today this is where we're at with certain bits yeah. this is your key stakeholders you're all in the room just so you know what's going on so there's a level of yeah. accountability you can't say well i wasn't aware of that it's like you were yeah. you were in the room with us all now we know where we're heading rest of the day just get that done so i think yeah. that's quite a, a nice way you kind of set the scene for the day mm. almost to say this is yeah. what we're doing go and excel at it go and make the, yeah. the players uh, experience as best as you can um, how, how do you sort of manage when you're working with teams? Because what I talked about, how I now feel that the culture, the value side of things is, if you can get that right, it can drive everything else. So I've tried different ways of doing it. And, you know, last year we got a leadership group within the squad to, to come up with their own sort of set of values. And, and they went for typical flip chart words, if I'm honest. But we, we talked about the danger of just having something on a flip chart. So we talked about passionate dedication and, and humility. So I, I was conscious that sometimes when we set those meetings up, if you're not careful, because you as a coach can have quite a bit of experience, it's quite easy to lead those meetings too much, if that makes sense. And actually what's meant to be a group thing suddenly becomes the experiences and the views of the head coach imposing a set of values on players. I mean, to an extent, it's probably even better to actually, as a head coach, get out of the room and leave it to the players. How do you guys go about doing that in your environment? So I guess there's two parts to this. Firstly, I work with real young ones predominantly. Yeah. So we do have at Southampton a set of values and stuff that we we kind of bang on about. They're mainly good people skills rather than yeah. so it's things like um be punctual. So, you know, trying to think and we appreciate this and sometimes all of us are late, but actually yeah. if you're in the building, there's no reason to be late somewhere if if you're in the building. Uh you know, saying hello to people, being polite, um, all the, all those types of things. There's loads of bits around that. In terms of what you've mentioned there around having the values, one thing we do do that I think is brilliant, and I, if I was working with older age groups, would be the way that I'd go with this, is have an external person do mm. player surveys with the players. Mm. Yeah. So we're doing it over the next fortnight where the players are going to do surveys on us as practitioners. Right. So what do they like? What they don't like? What yeah. do they think works? What do they think that doesn't work? It's anonymous. We yeah. will then thank them for completing it honestly. Yeah. And then we we'll sit down as a coaching pair or team and go, right, this is what's been fed back. Yeah. What are we going to do about it? Yeah. Um, so if I was to do it, I would have someone completely external come in mm -hmm. and kind of have the thing of, right, your coaches aren't here for a reason because yeah. we want this to be yours not theirs yeah. this we want this to be yours not the clubs 
So what do you want? Yeah. And then yeah. get them to do a group think of it and go, right, how are we going to present it back? Blah, blah, blah. And then allow you that, allow them that space to do it and come back to you. And then you can almost, I think, do it as a negotiation. Yeah. So you can say, well, I'm willing to take on board what you've said there around, um, I don't know, wanting rest periods over a certain yeah. period. However, my proviso to that is that when you are here, everyone's five minutes early. Yeah. Yeah. So it then becomes a mutually exclusive contract. It's like, well, we're we're willing to abide by what you want as a value system. Yeah. yeah. And you, I'm going to drip feed a couple in for what we think as yeah. an institution, organization, if you're going to yeah. represent us is important. And yeah. then we can make a contract together as two parties almost. Yeah. And then they can feel like it's their team. Because I think it's important whilst everyone works up and down an organization or institution or whatever, it's their team, isn't it? It's, yeah, that's, it's their team within that organization. So it's their team with this organization. We're going to merge our values with yours. And that's yeah. why you're a unique group. Yeah, I like that. I think that's important because what I'm finding to an extent is that, you know, I remember we talked about that fight earlier on and your point about the cultural architects was was great. And it's it's all I'm thinking, right, the leadership group, when they present their values at the end of January, I'm, I hope that's on there. And I'm sort of thinking that, well, if you're not careful, you, you see something with your eyes and it, it ends up being sort of Phil Ralph set of values and everything. And it's um it's imposed. One of our basketball coaches did the um stop, start, continue with players recently and just asked them. And, um, and it's typical of our place, really. I, ha- I was having a conversation with him at school prior to Christmas about this because he said, look, it was really enlightening. I was just about to get to the good bit and then got called into something else. So I'm still on the edge of my seat waiting to find out. But he is very open minded. He's really reflective about his coaching. And um, I think it was, it was it's a brave move, I think, sometimes as a coach. But equally, we provide feedback and generate feedback with players all the time. If we can't be role models and ambassadors to that process ourselves, then, you know, that's an issue for us, I think, isn't it? I did it for my A licence. Yeah. And the bit of feedback that they wanted more of was me joining in. Really? They said that the ability to see certain things where I joined in, yeah, um, they felt really helped. And they said like, okay. it, it makes it more enjoyable for us when at times you step in with us and act as a bounce player or act a particular right. technique. And I, I never would have guessed that. If no. you could have given me 100 guesses, that would not yeah. have been on my list. I would have been like, they pro- that's probably the bit they hate the most because it's like yeah. you, you <laughs> know, you're an adult playing in kids' football, potentially <laughs> ruining the game for them. But they, I yeah. had it on, I'd say there was only one or two out of maybe I asked 10 people that said yeah. that didn't say that the other eight came back and said we want you to join in more we want you to demonstrate more we want you to show us some ideas or you know you can do things so please please show us so oh, yeah really really, really interesting, interesting one so yeah i would recommend anyone listening do it because yeah. it comes back with some really insightful insightful yeah. stuff that is you know changed me as a practitioner yeah. um, and i actually mentioned it to one of the fa tutors and he said to me um, there's a particular technique I do because I'm ill-equipped on my left foot. So yeah. I do a very Varon style outside of the right foot play on the yeah. front foot. And he says, not many people do that. He goes, and you're actually giving them license to try it He goes, yeah. because you can do it well. Yeah. He said, so you talk about kids being brave to size stuff or see something for someone they respect and give it a go. He goes, yeah. you're showing them a technique that is rare mm. and actually allowing them to give it a go. So he said, yeah. Like it's a really good thing when I discuss that feedback with him. So yeah, I, I I definitely recommend those those surveys when they do come back will be will be interesting and definitely. No, that's useful. great. You haven't taken it to the next level and put yourself on penalties in every five side of it. Either that or goalkeeper. <laughs> when when we get to a penalty shootout, I'll go like right, get rid of that. I'm coming in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we go chill of air style but i'm conscious of time um just because yeah. obviously we're, we're, we're oh yeah and, yeah uh, we're, we're just yeah. past the hour and you probably want to yeah. go get some food and whatnot so sure. um last question for for me um which is if i were to speak to people that you coach or people you yeah. work with how would you yeah. want them to describe you in three words and why oh, that's a good one because um that's the sort of question i ask when i'm doing coach ed stuff um 
Okay, let's go three words. Caring, passionate, and developmental, I think. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Good question. I'm going to edit this bit out. I'll yeah. hang up for the podcast, but just hang fire for five minutes. No worries, Mike. So, yeah, listen, Phil, really a great conversation, great back and forth. I think, obviously, we've touched a little bit to some of your experiences there, but there's loads more that we, we could have touched on, which I'm sure we will at another point. But really appreciate your time and hopefully you can catch up again soon. Good man. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.